Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Today, our guest is D. William Lansborough, the author. The series is called Shadow's Advent. And if you love angels and fantasy mixed together, welcome to Hell on Earth. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. How did you, why angels, and how did you come up with this series? It is so good the way that there's this whole hell on earth and a demon war and angels coming in and angels that can't get in. It was wonderful. Thank you. It uh, it all came about because we all we all know a good good versus evil story, right? And I kind of wanted to play off of that. But what if we had the good versus evil story, but the evil side won? Uh, I think that makes for a much more interesting idea. If we have that, it's already resolved, and then we jump ahead a few years and see what's going on. So in Archangel, it's been 10 years since the war between heaven and hell erupted on Earth, and during that time, the demons won, and then Uriel, our Archangel, comes down. He's the only one left in heaven that can break through the black clouds that have surrounded the Earth, and so he comes down to a world he doesn't recognize. And I thought that's just a, a great starting off point for some potential there. Why angels? I love. I loved every minute of it. It was so engaging, and you really got attached to the characters. And I wanted to follow them everywhere. I really wanted to be friends with an angel too. There was, there, I, you were so good at capturing like the essence of what different cultures around the world think of angels and then you used angels from different cultures around the world that's what i tried to do initially when i set out on this writing journey i thought to myself okay i i really like the idea of angels and angels versus demons always make for great stories for me personally um but then i thought how do we make these angels a little more unique and how can we make them a little less you know, stereotypes are a little less what everybody knows. And so then I looked to other mythologies, other theologies, folklore, that kind of stuff. And I thought, how can I make this idea into an angel? And it, I kind of kick myself because in book one, I come up with this really cool angel that's uh, based on the Valkyrie from Norse mythology, but she unfortunately doesn't make it. <laughs> now that's not a spoiler for anyone watching. Um, <laughs> But, but I thought that's one of the coolest ones I've written. And, uh, and so I, I really want to adapt that more into the angels going forward. And there's just so much, so much already written out there to build up these kind of figures that I thought, let's take that and make them my own. I like how you did that because they, they truly fit the characteristics that are out there. And then the way they engage in the story seems true to their essence, the, the way right. they're depicted in each culture. And I love the way that you wrote Chandra and Dante, the half demon and the human that becomes very evil. And then his backstory, that was so like, <laughs> oh, you could totally understand how he might make some of the choices he did, but you would think like there's got to be like good and bad you know exactly and i think that one of the things that i really like writing about my characters especially in a story that has a lot of your stoic angels or angels that are supposed to be stoic or were at one point i like writing these flawed characters so uh chandra our half demon she grew up in a world that didn't accept her she's neither full human nor full demon neither side wants her and then Dante, on the other hand, is one of our main ant antagonists. But you don't have a good villain if they're just bad for bad's sake. 
And so by incorporating these flaws into Dante, into his background, I have some people, uh, I, I remember one person tweeted at me after they read Archangel, and it sticks with me to today because they said that they're hashtag Team Dante. And I absolutely loved it because I didn't think, A, that would ever happen with my writing, or B, that the villain would be written in such a way that other people could advocate for him, despite the actions that go on throughout the book. Yeah, I mean, he's... He's cool, he's, he's got a style, but no, I was still able to hate him through the first two books. <laughs> and I, I think that's the point, because he's not he's not a good person. What he's doing, I, he's killing angels, he's on par with angels, which is shocking to them, and they're used to defending humans, not being the one attacked by humans. So there, there's that dynamic going on between the two that this shouldn't be the way that it is. And so the atrocities that he commits throughout the story are awful, but he's still somewhat of a sympathetic character. Yeah, you you almost want to have sympathy for him, but you're still hoping that, you know, maybe he'll, like, realize the error of his ways. Like, at the end <laughs> of book two, you're like, yes, you deserve this. But, <laughs> I don't know. And then... Um, with Sandra, your heart just breaks for her. Yeah. You know, she's yeah. always trying to do the right thing. and It's tough. She, she Sometimes there's just no right way for someone to go because the world's kind of built against them. And in Chandra's case in particular, in the world, you had the angels, especially before they lost this war, thinking, you know, this is, this is a half demon. This is what they call an abomination right to her face. Um, and that is devastating for someone, especially, you know, when they're surrounded by these people that are rejecting her or this world that's rejecting her. Um, so your heart, your heart breaks for her, but she always tries to pull through. She tries to do what's right. Um, and she ends up changing some minds along the way because that's just who she is. <laughs> Definitely. And I love her relationship with, is it Uriel? Uriel. Yeah. I, I just really love the dynamics of that friendship. Mm -hmm. And that's what I kind of aim for in the first draft of Archangel. I'm, uh, some people are either going to love this or they're going to hate this if they've read the book. But it was originally going to be some kind of weird love triangle. And then I got some feedback where someone said, you know, Doug, don't don't just make it like that. Don't make it a cliche. Make it just a very strong friendship and see where it goes. And I think that the books have really benefited as a result of that. And I think their characters individually and together have benefited as a result from that. Definitely. I think it's more, you know, at, there's there's points where you wonder which way you're going to go. But then, you know, as you go, you realize that they've adopted each other as family and they're going to watch each other's back because they don't have anybody left. Exactly. And but then you also have the flip side. My fiance, when she finished reading Revelations, she said, I'll go leave a review and it'll say really good, but not enough kissing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have some people who are just in it for that. But I, I think that they have uh, that strong, like you said, it's like a family relationship because there's no one left for them. They're both kind of strangers in this new world, even amongst the angels that Uriel should connect with or knew from before the war. He is still an outsider because it's been 10 years since some of them have seen him and 10 long years that they've been trapped on this literal hell on earth. Right. And then harnessing the power that you don't think he should be associated with. That was really well done. Thank you. That's right. um, it. That's always a tough one. And it's tough to talk about without spoilers, too. But it's there's a lot going on, especially in the second book and. You know, it's called Revelations because we have all these characters having their own revelation. Uh, and it has, of course, the biblical name tie-in. Um, but the, one of the things that a lot of our characters have to come to terms with is that you can't just rely on, you know, being good. You can't just rely on the stuff that you relied on before that for anyone, ourselves included, or the characters in the book, you know, you have to change to overcome obstacles. And so we had a couple characters who had to give in to this darker power in order to accomplish the goals for good. That's true. <laughs> How did you come up with 
the outline and keep track of it because there's a lot of characters going through the book. Oh, and there's uh, Dante's, um, I, she's in charge of the military. Uh, Ursa, the demon? The oh, demon. Yeah. Like, she's a colonel, yeah. she's climbing the ladder. <laughs> yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's Ursa. <laughs> Ursa. She, and then there's the witch. Yes, Isabel. Oh, yeah. She's I... <laughs> evil, but Ursula, it was like, she's just, she's just unbelievably evil. She is, and so, I mean, to a counterpoint from before where I said, not not all great villains are just evil you do have you know we have demons on this planet and so there are some things that are just evil and they're just ambitious in their power and Ursa is one of those and she's doing everything she can to kind of climb that ladder and grow and even her story it's hinted at a little bit especially in revelations but it will develop more as the series goes on uh she came from nothing and so that desire for power comes from having absolutely nothing and clawing her way to the top. And so she thinks she deserves it and she thinks that she needs it just to validate herself. But what about the war tactics that are used throughout? Do you have a background as in the military or what do you do for research? I do not have a background in the military, um, almost the opposite. I, <laughs> um, right now I work for a charity. So so very far away from anything like that. Um, but it it is, you know, a key part of writing or writing effectively is doing your research. And so whether it be about the large scale conflicts or the one on one conflicts or how angels might behave um, or how worlds might look, you know, it all comes down to that research and and diving deep and taking that time. And uh, you mentioned before, you know, how do I how do I balance it all? How do I plot this all out? And with Archangel, it took me about five years from start to finish because I didn't plan it all out because I was just kind of writing by the seat of my pants or, you know, writing when inspiration hit me. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, a lot of stuff needed to change in the first draft or from the first draft because it just it just wasn't good. <laughs> it just needed refinement or it just didn't fit. Um, and so I've learned my lesson from that. And so that research and that plotting is super important for my books. Wow, because you think of Canada, you're you're like, uh, they're kind of like Switzerland, you know, or Denmark. <laughs> we're nice. Yeah, they're nice. <laughs> I thought they were nice. <laughs> it's, and that's the feedback I get for a lot of these books because it's dark fantasy. It's a little gruesome. It's a, a lot darker than a lot of stuff people are used to. Um, I get comments like, Doug. How, how can you be thinking of this stuff? <laughs> and so, so I say, I don't know, <laughs> but, but it makes for good writing. So. And nightmares. And um, nightmares. <laughs> but what about your fate? Who's your favorite monsters? Oh, Do you have a favorite are. monster or somebody that's favorite to write? My favorite to write again, goes back to Chandra or Dante, but when it comes to the monsters, I'd almost say Dante's a monster himself, even though he's human. He's one of the only humans in the book, but he he's worse than demons in a lot of cases. Um, but there are other monsters, too. There are the progeny that were introduced in Archangel. Um, and they even the scene that they were introduced in was a pretty creepy scene that, that gave some people nightmares. Um, but they were really fun just to rather than the angels where I had this thing to work off of this, you know, established mythology or theology, the progeny were wholly my creation. And that was a lot of fun to work with too. say, I, this monster is cool. Let's bring it to life. Yeah. Just because we <laughs> want to kill it. What other monsters are coming up that we haven't met yet? Any that you can I give us want... a peek at? I think that as we're going forward, um, one of the things that was introduced in Revelations is this idea of monsters that are older than than demons that kind of existed before those horrible things. And so there are going to be these monsters that are worse than demons that start showing up as the story evolves. And they're going to be you know, m monsters from the deepest shadows that no one's seen 
for for thousands of years and I'm getting really excited to write those ones. That sounds great. How many books are going to be in the series? There are going to be six books in the Shadows Advent series and uh, I'm aiming to get one out every year. So since Revelations came out in December, <laughs> I have to get one out by at least December of this year. <laughs> wow, when did Shadows Advent first come out? The Archangel uh, book Archangel. on the Shadows Advent dropped in uh, February of 2019. So it actually took me a, a little over a year to write Revelations the way I wanted it. And then there's a whole you know, following process to writing a book. So revising it and getting it edited and preparing it for publication and whatnot. Um, but so that, that took a little over a year. So I'm just trying to get more consistent with my writing, make it a bigger habit. And then, uh, and then satisfy the fans that keep saying, Doug, <laughs> when's the next one coming? <laughs> it's true. Cause we want to know what happens next. So did you self publish? Yes. Yeah. I self published both of them. Um, I've wanted to be a writer since, you know, I, since I can remember pretty much since whenever I started reading the fantasy genre and growing up, it was always, you know, you, you really need to catch that lucky break to be a writer. You could write the best book, but if no one's going to read it, then what's the point? And then sort of as I was growing up, there was this evolution from self-publishing where it was something that was looked down upon. Really. It was like, Oh, you self-published your book. I'm never going to touch that to a viable strategy and career for a lot of people. And because I self-published it, you know, there, there are some lessons that I've learned since publishing Archangel for the first time, but I have a lot more control, like the covers for both of them, which I absolutely adore. Um, I got those done myself. I reached out to an artist I was introduced to, we went back and forth, and I, I think they're both perfect. Um, and I don't think you have that same control. You have some control, don't get me wrong, with traditional publishing, and it might be a route that I look at later, but but there's a lot of control and a lot of advantages to self-publishing as well. Well, you picked a great team. Your editing team is outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because in self-published books, sometimes you'll find, you know, errors or grammatical or spelling, and you're like, how did you miss that? But there's nothing like that. The story is a really good flow. Everything moves. It's not forced. It's <laughs> It's seriously... Like, was it, I don't know, Steven Spielberg kind of just <laughs> like draws you in and you're like, oh, I didn't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's funny you mention uh, Spielberg or just directors, because I think when I'm writing, that's the kind of attitude I take is how am I envisioning this scene? If this, you know, were a movie, how would it play out? Now let's add the extra detail that really makes you know books worth reading um and it's funny you mentioned the editing too because i've had some great you know great feedback um to develop the story and i have some great editors but there's this one line and <laughs> i used to be ashamed of this but now i think it's hilarious in uh in archangel mm -hmm. there's a line where uriel covers his ears with his hands um but in the initial draft and in the <laughs> the first kind of printing of archangel he covers his hands with his ears, which just doesn't make any sense. Uh, <laughs> but right. but it, it's funny whenever you read that. And it's like, sometimes you can go over it a million times. I'm a professional editor myself. I gave it to a professional editor with a great background in editing. But you can't catch everything every time. Every work's going to have an error. And that one just makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's good to have a couple of different editors work on it because they have different perspectives of the way they look at it and read in general. Yeah. But I thought it was outstanding. <laughs> it really just drew you in. You're like, ah, oh, yes, Archangel's coming. It's all going to be good. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but the fight to get there and just the relationships the losses, the gains, it was really well played out. Thank you. And I think that's why I really like the dark fantasy genre, especially. And I, I always point out this is a dark fantasy rather than just, you know, a fantasy or a post-apocalyptic fantasy, um, because there are some really, really dark moments to it. There are some really, you know, adult moments to it. There are some really sad moments to it. 
But I write that way because I feel like when we overcome those dark moments, then what we gain is even better. Like the kind of light that we bring into it is even brighter because of that darkness we have to go through. Yeah, there are some really good ones where, especially with that witch, which is <laughs> like the act and incident is so atrocious that you have, like you literally feel like the air has been sucked out of you. Yep. Because of her callous disregard for anything, anybody. Absolutely. And those those aren't easy to write either. Um, you know, action scenes tend to come pretty well for me. They tend to flow. Um, but the darker scenes, especially the really, really dark scenes, those take a couple of passes. Those take, you know, a couple of times sitting down saying, I need to step away for a second and then I need to come back and write it so that it's authentic and it's worth reading. Um, but yeah, some of them aren't easy. <laughs> now it's kind of like Edgar Allan Poe or something. <laughs> the telltale <laughs> heart. You're like, oh, that is just creepy. Um, what's your background? What do you do for a living? You so my background... Oh, Go ahead. My, my background um, is a little bit of a mixed bag. Initially, when I you know, went to university, I thought, I want to be a doctor. And then I changed my mind. And then I changed my mind. And then I changed my mind. And I ended up graduating with a political science degree, thinking, you know, I want to change the world. And then that didn't necessarily play out the way that it does, as recent graduates do. So I went back to school for communications and writing, thinking, I really want to write this book, but I also want to incorporate writing into my daily life. So now I work as a communications professional for a local charity. I do freelance editing and writing, and the books are becoming a substantial part of my career as well, and I hope that they become an even bigger part in the future. I can definitely see that happening. <laughs> Thank you. You have a wonderful style, a very dark style, <laughs> but still uplifting in a way, mm. and there's still that chase of what's going to happen next, what's next twist, where are we going? But it just moves so fluidly. Thank you. And I think you need you need that light at the end of the tunnel, too, to kind of keep you going through through all the dark stuff that's happening. And it's funny because in between this and the next Shadows Advent book, I'm trying my hand at a horror novel, um, which is even darker, which I had to say to my fiance, Sarah, after writing a scene. No, Sarah, you can't read this. <laughs> you, you cannot read this book. Um, but it's a totally different writing style, too. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's definitely on my alley. So I'm excited for both coming up. Oh, that sounds great. All right. So we've got the dark fantasy, a horror novel coming up. What else have you written? Have you written any other series? I haven't written or I haven't published any other series yet. Um, I am writing a series of urban fantasy short stories um, that will be once they're done published in sort of an anthology. And that's really harking back to, you know, uh, monsters exist in the world and there are these people that keep us safe. Except the twist is that our main character, Claire, a.k.a. Nightshade, which is what the series is named after, is a monster herself one that can't die and can do all these weird things and nobody knows what kind of monster she is. So it creates this dynamic where again, she's the outsider. I think that's almost a running theme in a lot of my writing um, because it drives really strong characters. She's this outsider, but she's doing this great work. So her work is sort of recognized, but at the same time she's rejected and, and hurt um, by other people because she's different. Wow. Oh. That one sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it your way when it's ready. <laughs> Thanks. But I love the other fact is, even though it's gruesome, even though it has these wonderful angels and these horrific demons and humans mixed into the bundle, you're also good with, like, quirky, funny dialogue. Like, insert it at the absolute, like, worst moments. It was so good. I really enjoyed it. And I think um, that comic relief is is important, especially, again, in darker writing. If it's too grim, people are just going to get defeated. They're going to say, you know, what's the point of continuing? Because I'm just going to feel worse and worse. So if we aren't close to that light, we just need a little kind of spark 
to keep us going. And I think that's one of the reasons I really like Chandra. Um, or there's some other angels. Isnir, for example, is an angel um, that has a lot of personality going for him. And so they really lighten the mood without taking you out of the immersion of the, the dark atmosphere that we're in, just kind of helping you through it. Definitely. But they're well-developed. They have their little idiosyncrasies, their little hang-ups. Uh, and it's just amazing how they can bond, click. And it's astounding that some of the awful things that happen from both sides of the group. Absolutely. And I think with angels, because of the angels that have been on Earth for so long in this hell on Earth, you know, they're no longer the perfect beings they were. And so they doing the horrible things, they might not necessarily like it, but they're OK with it, which is something that shocks a lot of other angels. Yeah, I think it's OK when it's the demons. <laughs> well, but when there's question, it's questionable about who was really involved. You're like, oh. <laughs> but I love that they you know, if there's a human involved in the attack, that they're more like it's taking a step back because they're there to protect humans. Where did you get the insights into where angels go after they die? That's a great question. Um, I always kind of figured, you know, if there's this heaven and hell, then uh, as you know, a lot of people believe if a human dies, their soul goes one way or the other. But if you're from one of those places already and angels in particular they don't have a physical form in heaven they only adopt that physical form when they come to earth in the shadows advent series and so if that form is destroyed their their essence is destroyed it's not like they're housing a soul um so their physical being is them and if that's destroyed then they're just gone and i think that really you know raises the stakes for them because if it was if an angel dies and goes back to heaven they're happy, probably. <laughs> they're content going back home, especially if they've been stuck on Earth. But uh, doing it this way is substantially raised stakes for them. That was one other thing just before we close. I love the way that you explained like how humans were made in the image of God, not the physical person, just the soul part. Mm -hmm. It was just really well delivered, and it was just like a good delivery. It made you stop and think. Thank you, and that's what I'm trying to do because I don't, I don't necessarily want to say you know one idea of thinking is right, but I want to say this is you know the world that I've created. This is the world that I want you to enjoy, and I think this might be the way that that it was done. And I, I think that creating a soul in the image of yourself is, is a great way for some kind of creator to do something like that. Exactly. And it just made you ask more questions about different aspects of that whole side of it. Although, you know, the stories are not religious in any way, <laughs> <laughs> but the essence of all the angels from the different cultures is right on point. They react in the way that you would expect them to based on what we already know of them. So that made it a great read. Thanks for sharing how you created it. You're very welcome. And thank you for all the kind words. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. Definitely. Can't wait to see more <laughs> from you. <laughs> Wonderful. Until next time, keep asking questions. And if you want some great books about angels and demons, not the typical, but a definitely a dark fantasy, this is the author to check out. We'll see you soon.